The sentinels saw them coming a little before sunset, when the sea was flat and blinding. The sentinels were pacing the second tallest of the many awry towers that sprouted up from the castle and made it resemble one of those odd trees that grow with their roots in the air. From where they stood, the two men could survey the entire valley of Hagsgate, as far as the town and the sharp hills beyond, as well as the road that ran from the rim of the valley to the great, though sagging, front gate of King Hagard's castle. "'A man and two women,' said the first sentinel. He hurried to the far side of the tower, a stomach-startling motion since the tower tilted so that half of the sentinel's sky was sea. The castle sat on the edge of a cliff, which dropped like a knife-blade to a thin yellow shore, frayed bare over green and black rocks. Soft, baggy birds squatted on the rocks, snickering, side so, side so. The second man followed his comrade across the tower at an easier pace. He said, a man and a woman, the third one in a cloak. I'm not certain of the third. Both men were clad in homemade mail, rings, bottle caps, and links of chain sewn onto half-cured hides, and their faces were invisible behind rusted visors, but the second sentinel's voice and gait alike marked him as the elder. The one in the black cloak, he said again, do not be too sure of that one too soon. But the first sentinel leaned out into the orange glare of the tipped-up sea, scraping a few studs loose from his poor armor on the parapet. It is a woman, he declared. I would doubt my own sex before hers. And well you may, the other observer sardonically said. And since you do nothing that becomes a man but ride a straddle, I'll warn you again. Be slow to call that third male or female. Wait a little and see what you see. The first sentinel answered him without turning. If I had grown up never dreaming that there were two separate secrets to the world, if I had taken every woman I met to be exactly like myself, still I would know that this creature was different from anything I had ever seen before. I have always been sorry that I have never pleased you, but now, when I look at her, I am sorry that I have never pleased myself. Oh, I am sorry. He bent still further over the wall, straining his eyes towards the three slow figures on the road. A chuckle clattered behind his visor. The other woman looks sore-footed and bad-tempered, he reported. The man appears an amiable sort, though plainly of the strolling life. A minstrel like enough, or a player? He said nothing more for a long while, watching them draw near. And the third? The older man inquired presently. Your sundown fancy with the interesting hair? Have you outworn her in the quarter of an hour? Already seen her closer than love dares? His voice rustled in his helmet like small, clawed feet. I don't think I could ever see her closely, the sentinel replied, however close she came. His own voice was hushed and regretful, echoing with lost chances. She has a newness, he said. Everything is for the first time. See how she moves? How she walks? How she turns her head? All for the first time. The first time anyone has ever done these things. See how she draws her breath and lets it go again, as though no one else in the world knew that air was good. It is all for her. If I learned that she had been born this very morning, I would only be surprised that she was so old. The second sentinel stared down from his tower at the three wanderers. The tall man saw him first, and next the dour woman. Their eyes reflected nothing but his armor, grim and cankered and empty. But then, the girl in the ruined black cloak raised her head, and he stepped back from the parapet, putting out one tin glove against her glance. In a moment she passed into the shadow of the castle with her companions, and he lowered his hand. She may be mad, he said calmly. No grown girl looks like that unless she is mad. That would be annoying, but far preferable to the remaining possibility. Which is? The younger man prompted after a silence. Which is that she was indeed born this morning. I would rather that than she were mad. Let us go down now. When the man and the woman reached the castle, the two sentries were standing on either side of the gate, their blunt, bent halberds crossed, 
and their falchions hitched round in front of them. The sun had gone down, and their absurd armor grew steadily more menacing as the sea faded. The travelers hesitated, looking at one another. They had no dark castle at their backs, and their eyes were not hidden. "'Give me your names,' said the parched voice of the second sentinel. The tall man stepped a pace forward. "'I am Schmendrick the Magician,' he said. "'This is Molly.' Grew my helper, and this is Lady Amalthea. He stumbled over the name of the white girl, as though he had never spoken it before. We seek audience with King Haggard, he continued. We have come a long way to see him. The second sentinel waited for the first to speak, but the younger man looked only at the lady, Amalthea. Impatiently, he said, state your business with King Haggard. I will, the magician replied, to King Haggard himself. What kind of royal matter could it be that I might confide to doormen and porters? Take us to the king. What kind of royal matter could a wandering wizard with a foolish tongue have to discuss with King Haggard? The second sentinel asked somberly. But he turned and strode through the castle gate, and the king's visitors straggled after him. Last wandered the younger sentinel, his step grown as tender as that of the Lady Amalthea, whose every movement he imitated unaware. He, she stayed a moment before the gate, looking out to the sea, and the sentinel did the same. His former comrade called angrily to him, but the young sentry was on a different duty, answerable to a new captain for his derelictions. He entered at the gate only after Lady Amalthea had chosen to go in. Then he followed, singing to himself in a dreary drone, What is this that is happening to me? What is this that is happening to me? I cannot tell whether to be glad or be afraid. What is this that is happening to me? They crossed a cobbled courtyard where a cold laundry groped their faces and passed through a smaller door into a hall so vast that they could not see the walls or the ceiling in the darkness. Great stone pillars rushed up to them as they trudged across the hall, and they leaned away without ever really letting themselves be seen. Breath echoed in that huge place, and the footsteps of other smaller creatures sounded just as clearly as their own. Molly Grew stayed quite close to Spendrick. After the great hall, there came another door, and then a thin stair. There were few windows, and no lights. The stair coiled tighter and tighter as it ascended, until it seemed that every step turned round on itself, that the tower was closing on them all like a sweaty fist. The darkness looked at them and touched them. It had a rainy, doggy smell. Something rumbled somewhere deep and near, the tower trembled like a ship run aground, and answered with a low stone wail. The three travelers cried out, scrambling to keep their feet on the shuddering stairs, but their guide pressed on without faltering or speaking. The younger man whispered earnestly to the Lady Amalthea, "'It's all right. Don't be afraid. It's just the bull.' The sound was not repeated. The second sentinel halted abruptly, produced a key from a secret place, and jabbed it, apparently, straight into the blank wall. A section of the wall swung inward, and the small procession filed into a low, narrow chamber with one window and a chair at the far end. There was nothing else, no furnishings, no rug, no draperies, no tapestries. In the room were five people, the tall chair and the mealy light of the rising new moon. This is King Haggard's throne room, said the sentinel. The magician gripped him by his mailed elbow and turned him until they faced each other. This is a cell! This is a tomb! No living king sits here. Take us to Haggard if he's alive. You must judge that for yourself, replied the scurrying voice of the sentinel. He unlaced his helmet and lifted it from his gray head. I am King Haggard, he said. His eyes were the same color as the horns of the red bull. He was taller than Schmendrick, and though his face was bitterly lined, there was nothing fond or foolish in it. It was a pike's face, the jaws long and cold, the cheeks hard, and the lean neck alive with power. 
He might have been seventy years old, or eighty or more. The first sentinel came forward now with his own helmet under his arm. Molly Grew gasped when she saw his face, for it was the friendly, rumpled face of the young prince who had read a magazine while his princess tried to call a unicorn. King Haggard said, This is Lear. Hi, said Prince Lear. Glad to meet you. His smile wriggled at their feet like a hopeful puppy, but his eyes, a deep shadowy blue behind stubby lashes, rested quietly on the eyes of Lady Amalthea. She looked back at him, silent as a jewel, seeing him no more truly than men see unicorns. But the prince felt strangely, happily certain that she had looked him round and through and down into caverns that he had never known were there, where her glance echoed and sang. Prodigies began to waken somewhere southwest of his twelfth rib, and he himself, still mirroring, mirroring the Lady Amalthea, began to shine.